Hadi bacak ben çağırayım. Asıl karadeniz için var. Biz de ben de şimdi yapayım. Bak bir beden de dinlenir. Onun maharaj oldu. Yes, kan bende bir çağrı yaptı. Bu da types of orders and statuses of social life, knowledge of the renounced order of life, knowledge of non-attachment, sense and mind control, meditation, etc. He is described in so many ways different types of religion now in summarizing Bhagavad Gita. The Lord says that Arjuna should give up all the processes that have been explained to him. He should simply surrender to Krishna. That surrender will save him from all kinds of sinful reactions, for the Lord personally promises to protect him. In the eighth chapter, it was said that only one who has become free from all sinful reactions can take to the worship of Lord Krishna. Thus, one may think that unless he is free from all sinful reactions, he cannot take to the surrendering process. 
to such doubts, it is here said that even if one is not free from all sinful reactions, <laughs> simply by the process of surrendering to Sri Krishna, he is automatically freed. There is no need of strenuous effort to free oneself from sinful reactions. One should not hesitatingly accept Krishna as the supreme savior of all living entities. With faith and love, one should surrender to Him. <clears throat> the process of surrender to Krishna is described in the Hari Bhakti Vilas 11676. According to the devotional process, one should simply accept such religious principles that will lead ultimately to the devotional service of the Lord. One may perform a particular occupational duty according to his position in the social order, but if by executing his, his, his duty one does not come to the point of Krishna consciousness, all his activities are in vain. Anything that does not be the perfectional stage of Krishna consciousness should be avoided. One should be confident that in all circumstances Krishna will protect him from all difficulties. There is no need of thinking how one should keep the body and soul together. Krishna will see to that. One should always think himself helpless and should consider Krishna the only basis for his progress in life. As soon as one seriously engages himself in devotional service to the Lord in full Krishna consciousness, at once he becomes freed from all contamination of material nature. There are different processes of religion and purificatory processes by cultivation of knowledge, meditation, and the mystic yoga system, etc. But, one who surrenders unto Krishna does not have to execute so many methods. That simple surrender unto Krishna will save him from unnecessarily wasting time. <coughs> one can thus make all progress at once and be freed from all sinful reactions. One should be attracted by the beautiful vision of Krishna. His name is Krishna because he is all attractive. One becomes attracted by the beautiful, all-powerful, omnipotent vision of Krishna is fortunate. There are different kinds of transcendentalists. Some of them are attached to the impersonal Brahman vision. Some of them are attracted by the super soul feature, etc. But one who is attracted to the personal feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and, above all, one who is attracted by the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Krishna Himself is the most perfect transcendentalist. In other words, devotional service to Krishna in full consciousness is the most confidential part of knowledge, and this is the essence of the whole Bhagavad Gita. Karma yogis, empiric philosophers, mystics and devotees are called transcendentalists, but one who is a pure devotee is the best of all. The particular words used here are ma shuchaha. Don't fear, don't hesitate, don't worry, are very significant. One may be perplexed as to how one can give up all kinds of religious forms and simply surrender unto Krishna, but such worry, such worry is useless.
सागर surrendering to Krishna is useless, a waste of time. You have nothing to do except surrendering to Krishna. Well, it doesn't mean you can't execute other occupational duties. The problem makes that point. Other occupational duties can be done. How does, how does that, how, what is the problem mentality of doing that? Prabhupada points out, he says, one may perform a particular occupational duty. You may be a father, a mother, you may be a, a, an employee or a business owner or a, a, you know, a citizen of a country. So many things you may have, duties you may have like that. External occupational duties. So one may perform those duties, but in what consciousness is it? In what consciousness do you do those duties? That will make you or break you in the spiritual time. Prabhupada elaborates, one may perform a particular occupational duty according to his position in the social order, but if by executing his duty he does not come to the point of Krishna consciousness, all his activities are in vain. Anything that does not lead to the directional stage of Krishna consciousness should be avoided. So in other words, whatever occupational duties you may have as a mother, a father, an employee, or a business owner, a government official, or whatever, you have to execute those duties in such a way that you, they're, they're helping you to become more Krishna conscious. And if you don't, you're just cutting your foot. Cutting your foot. So if you're a parent, it means you have to make your children Krishna conscious. Let's see. If you're an employee earning money, you have to earn money for Krishna. You can't earn money for sense gratification. All that money has to be for Krishna. You can't spend a penny on sense gratification. You can, as Bhaktivedanta Kaur says, now I am working to support Krishna's household. So you have to see your household as Krishna's property and create an ash, make your home into an ashram, not a place of sense gratification, watching mundane television. You have to make your home an ashram, a place of spiritual cultivation. And then by your work, to maintain that, and by, and by your donations you give to the preachers and to the temple, that then your work becomes part of your self-realization process. In other words, you have to turn everything you're doing into the self-realization process. Every duty you have, otherwise you can't dovetail that duty with Krishna's service. You should give it up. You should give it up. You should only accept occupational duties insofar as you can utilize them 
to advance your Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, you shouldn't do them at all. You should give them up completely. Abandon them. Sarvadharman for the Abandon them. That's all. Just give them up. Sarvadharman. Give up all the duties. That, abandon all any duties that you cannot use in Krishna's service. Abandon them. Because you have one duty only, and that's to become Krishna. If you don't have this one-pointed consciousness, you have what's known as splayed intelligence. Dancing around here and there, dancing. You won't be able to focus on Krishna if you don't have this fixity of consciousness. Yato yato nishtalati manashtam salamastaram There's a lamp in a windless place does not waver. You see, you have to make your consciousness like that. You have one purpose in life only, and that is to become fully, completely surrendered to Krishna. That should be every thing of your life should be funneled into that. Every thought that goes through your brain, you have to analyze. Is this thought helping me to advance in Krishna consciousness? Every word that comes out of your mouth, everything you listen to, everything you do, you have to see that it's, you have to funnel it into your spiritual process. Because actually, if you have any agenda besides advancing in Krishna consciousness, you're in a state of illusion. You're in a state of illusion. You're putting your eggs in the wrong basket, as the old saying goes. <clears throat> You put your energy into something else, it's just a waste because that will all be taken away sooner or later, today or tomorrow or next week or next year. Anything besides your advancing in Krishna consciousness is only a temporary thing, it won't last. Your family duty, your society duty, your job duty, whatever duties you may have, duty, 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 they will all, they're all here today and gone tomorrow. Because they're all related to your material body, which is only temporary. That material body is not you. It isn't you. Kick out this idea, when you look in the mirror, you're looking at yourself. You're not. You're looking at a covering of the sun. It's not you. Kick it out. Just kick it out. The root. It's not you. You're an eternal spiritual being, qualitatively one with Krishna. So anything you do which does not bring you back to that, you're simply cheating yourself. You're cutting your own throat. So don't be an idiot cutting your own throat. Committing suicide. Don't do that. You work for your own liberation. That's your duty, number one duty. First you, if you're a first message, liberate yourself. And then First, how you can liberate others if you're not liberated? If you're not fixed in Krishna consciousness, how you can make your family Krishna conscious? How you can make your friends Krishna conscious? How you can make your country Krishna conscious? How we can make the world Krishna conscious if we are not Krishna conscious? So your first duty is you must see that you are fixed in Krishna consciousness. That is your that is the moment of the You must see that you are solidly fixed in Krishna consciousness. That will be your success. And without that, your life is a failure. Simply a failure. It doesn't matter whether you're initiated or not. If you're not fixed in Krishna consciousness, your life is a failure. You see? Somebody getting initiated doesn't mean now you're saved, no. Um, here we have a, well, it's not a good example. There's a tripod over there. You see, there's three legs. The camera's sitting on a tripod. There's only two legs that fall over. Only one leg that fall over. Three legs makes it solid. So we have our tripod, three things. You take shelter of the spiritual master, you get initiated by the spiritual master, and you obey the spiritual master. So getting initiated isn't enough. Now you have to take the orders of your spiritual master as your life and soul. That's how you become solid in Krishna consciousness. 
Shelter, Diksha, and Obedience. S-D-O is the way to go. Shelter, Diksha, and Obedience. Somebody, Shelter and Diksha, that's not enough. If you're not obedient to your spiritual master, you're not really his disciple. You haven't really taken shelter of them. You have to take shelter, take Diksha, which is a formalization of shelter by a vow, and then you have to actually fulfill the terms of your agreement, of your vow, to obey your spiritual master. If you do that, then you're, you're going to be on the right track. You're going to be saying Krishna Loka, you leave your body. Otherwise, you take breath again. Not some easy thing, you just put some tea lock in your nose and you're going back to go Haribo and you go back to God. You have to actually surrender. You have to actually give yourself, your heart and soul, to Guru and Krishna completely. Now, just like Arjun did, you see. Now I'm under your orders. What do you tell me to do? I'll do it that time. Tell me to kill my family members? Okay, no problem. I'll kill them. That's pretty happy. Don't worry, your guru is not going to tell you to kill your family members. He might tell, them, he might tell you to kill their demoniac consciousness by making him devotees. That killing he will tell you. Kill the demonic mentality of your family members and the society in general. That's our killing the Kali Yuga. You kill the demonic mentality by preaching. So yes, that killing the Kill the demonic mentality by preaching about Krishna. Telling him it's wrong to engage in sense gratification. You have to stop serving your senses. Indriya Seva is the pathway to death. Give up Indriya Seva and take up Krishna Seva. So perhaps there's some questions we can try to answer them. Okay. And this verse states, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender to Krishna. One who reads this verse literally may say that one has to abandon all religions, including the Hare Krishna movement. Well, read the purport, okay? And read all Bhagavad Gita. Don't take things out of context. Everything is understood in context. Did Arjun give up Krishna consciousness? No, he surrendered to Krishna. Um, the point is surrender to Krishna. Give up anything which is besides surrendering to Krishna. So this is actually religion in the, in the small R, not the capital R. <coughs> Even in the verse, it's all varieties of religion with a small R. It doesn't say give up religion, it says varieties of religion. That means pseudo-religion. Yeah. It also means the duties, the rituals that the devotees, the people do from the Vedic ritual. The Sanskrit word is dharma. Um, it refers to um, activities, any activity besides the one dharma of serenity of Krishna. That's what it means. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to understand according to the Vaishnava Acharyas. You cannot understand according to your own imagination. This is why the purports are important, this is why a guru is important. This is why advanced devotees are an important thing. When Krishna says, give up all varieties of religion and surrender to me, he's saying there's actually only one religion that's surrendering to me. Everything else besides surrendering to me is not really religion, that's the point. How this process of surrendering to Krishna works in practice? Well, I already explained you. take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master, you follow his instructions. He engages you in chanting at least 16 rounds every day of the Hare Krishna mantra, giving up illicit sex, mediating intoxication and gambling, reading Prabhupada's books, living Prabhupada's books, distributing Prabhupada's books, becoming a part of the ISKCON spiritual family, engaging in loving exchanges with all the devotees, in many varieties of ways, and services, and festivals, and preaching. In this way, immerse yourself into the culture of Krishna consciousness. 
And this will, this is how will help you to awaken that little God within your heart. Tell you want to add something, feel free. Do you agree that we must first become a good human being and then a devotee? Well, the verse clearly says, even if you're not a good human being, just go ahead and surrender, that will make you a good human being. It's very clearly stated here. Um, no, even if you're a, even if you're a, a giant Madai character, even if you're a, you know, an ISIS terrorist, whatever you may be, whatever you are, just come and surrender to Krishna, and immediately you become a good human being. You don't have to first become a good human being and then surrender. No, just surrender, and everything will come automatically to them. Already initiated devotee, what are the qualities that someone must have? There's 26 qualities of the Vaishnavas given in the Chaitanya Charamita. <clears throat> he's tolerant, he's meek, he's mild, uh, he's magnanimous. Um, these qualities are listed. There's also the Raminical qualities. Shamadamastapacho, Sham, Shamte, Rajan, Adiyavacha. He is Shama, he has equanimity. He sees happiness and distress as both equal manifestations of the Lord's mercy upon him. Shama Dhamma, he, Dhamma, he controls his senses. Tapa, he's austere, he rises early in the morning, he doesn't sleep late after the sunrise. Tapa, Shok Chum, he takes his bath regularly. In this way, there are many qualities described. Why does a baby die in an accident? That's the karma of that living entity. And the, there are previous sinful activities. He, he didn't live a very long lifespan. Why did Krishna have many wives? Well, Krishna actually owns everything. Every man, woman, and child belongs to Krishna. So Krishna naturally has many, he would naturally have many wives. Actually, woman, every woman belongs to Krishna. He only marries 16,000 women and ladies, but actually all the women belong to Krishna. Huh? What about the men? Are they well, he doesn't men? marry men, I mean, you know. I mean, they say belonging, all the living I mentioned that. He doesn't marry men, because he's men. Krishna's not in the same sex marriage like that. No, but everyone is protected, enjoyed by Krishna. Well, some men become women in the spiritual world, you know. Because swamis are gopis. Yeah. <clears throat> There's different rasas. Some, um, some have a, some are gopis, some are gopas, some are cows, some are calves, some are butterflies, some are um, <clears throat> rocks. Somebody is a devotee is a peacock feather. The devotee is Krishna's dhoti. You know. Gopi girls. You know. Huh? Uh, we sing, make me a yes. Um, yeah, we're praying to be a maidservant of Krishna in, in the Tulsi prayer. Yes. Dasi. And all these Yasis and Brahmacharis praying to become Dasi in the Tulsi prayer. <clears throat> we leave that to Krishna, but that's it's a nice move. <clears throat> So Yiskan preaches that you're not your body. Yiskan, that's interesting, Yiskan preaches. <laughs> the members of Yiskan preach uh, that you're not your body, yet in the temple men and women sit separately. Yes, because if we sit together, we'll forget that we're not our bodies. That's why. <laughs> oh, that cute little girl, or that cute little beautiful woman sitting right behind me. <laughs> we sit separately so we'll, to help us remember that we're not our bodies and not get carried away by attraction for the opposite thing. There's some electricity that happens when you get males and females, especially young men and women. But it can happen in any age, actually. No one's immune. There's one story of one, uh, one king, he, he couldn't believe that sex, the uh, Brahmana told him that sex desire is there, even up to the moment of death. He said, no way, it's not possible. He couldn't be lusty all the way to the moment of death. So he said, just wait, someday I will show you. So, 
one day that there was somebody dying. So he said, took the king, okay, let's go visit this dying person. And he said, and he told the king, and you bring your daughter with you. So the man's lying on his deathbed. The king, his, the king of the whole empire walks in, and the, the daughter comes in. Mainly he looks at the daughter. <laughs> so just... So even on the deathbed, he's looking for the daughter instead of the king. So this sex desire, you can't say, well, I remember one devotee, he told his government, yeah, I'm over the hill now. He's thinking, well, I'm in the 40s, you know, sex desire is gone. Yeah, I'm over the hill now, he told his government. And the government of chocolate, he said, yeah, you're over the hill, but you're not out of the woods. <laughs> so therefore, we sit separately. We sit separately. Because Cupid is flying around with his little quiver of arrows, just ready to boom. <laughs> he's talking, happy with some arrows. But, uh, that is another thing, but we are not on that stage yet that we can all intermingle together because uh, if somebody is pure, totally, they wouldn't, they can go into music. In Krishna, what we read, they were actually throwing, they were getting together, throwing yoga on each other, and you could see the women's breasts through their saris and everything, and nobody was agitated. But we're on that level. We can't imitate those things. We're not there. We're not there. That's why separation is required. We require the separation because we're not on the level on the Brahman, on the Brahman, we're not Brahman realized yet. We're still thinking male, female. Even though we know it's not the, the, the facts, we still relate emotionally, we still emotionally act as, feel as male and women, men and women. We still feel that. So we have to be on guard against that. We protect ourselves by the separation. Amen. Even in the time of Krishna, this was the standard. When Krishna left from Mathura, the ladies and the men all came to see him off. The men saw him off on the street, the ladies saw him off on the rooftop. That's how much there was separation. Some people have said, well, this separation between men and women was introduced in the Muslim era, but no. This was there even in the time of Krishna. The men saw him off on the street and the women were seeing him off on the rooftop. It's described in Bhagavata. So this separation is for our protection. Because we love our women, therefore we don't mingle too closely with them because we want to see them as mothers, not as, as they say in America, chicks, a cool chick. You know, we want to see them as our mothers, not a chick. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> okay, over and above that, Iskan preaches that women must be housewives instead of working outside with their, with their karmic. Now, there's not a hard and fast rule about that. I mean, Papa did say that. But there's no policy in this kind that no women are allowed to work. We don't have such a policy. Many of our women do work. Probably many of you women here are working women. We don't have such a policy in this kind, although it is the Vedic system. And it is ideal. Um, and we recommend it, but it's certainly not, certainly not any rule that you're initiated a devotee now, you, all the women initiates can't get jobs or forbid. No, there's no rule like that in this case. It's not a policy in this case. It's not the rules and regulation about that. But when we talk about one the ashram system, one is supposed to perform one's prescribed duty. What is the prescribed duty for the women? It is. Turning to Varnashram, women don't work on the outside. That's Varnashram. They don't. Uh, I know when I was a kid growing up in America, the women didn't work. All the, the men, the women stayed at home. And um, there was even a popular TV show when I was a kid called Father Knows Best. <laughs> it was a, a typical American family. The, the mother stayed at home and, and wonderful. Was, the house was spotlessly clean. There was fantastic meals. Everybody's laundry was perfectly clean. All the kids were being well disciplined and cared for, they weren't running wild. The mother was there always to keep an eye on the kids. Everything was very nice. So, so when, as soon as you send the mothers to work, the kids go into daycare, they become juvenile delinquents, there's no supervision. It's just the, the social thing falls apart. They said we need the money. Well, formally, and they, in those days, that the one income is sufficient to support the family. They weren't, there were no women working. That was, that was not the system after World War II. I mean, all of, during World War II, they went to the factories, 
an amendment of the battlefield, an amendment of the factories to build the bombs and the bullets. And then after the war, they all came home again. The husbands came back from the war, the wives came back from the defense factory, and they all had happy family life living together. And the women all stayed at home and the husbands all went to work. And there was plenty of money for everyone. It was just one income. But now the, the, they've created an artificial situation for just to buy a house, yet both, both men and women have to work. You see. But I never sent my wife to work. Even though we didn't have much money. We were so poor one time, we didn't have even a house or an apartment. We were living in a van. Siddhar Swami said, yeah, your van across this mountain. <laughs> we were living in a van. <laughs> Literally, we were living in a van. We had no home. We were like gypsies. We were like gypsies. We had we, all. We had a little money for gas and a little money for food. We have no money in the bank. We had. We were completely broke, living in a van. We were happy. We were. We were distributing back uh, Bhagavad Gita's in a complete bliss, driving all over America in our van, distributing Bhagavad Gita's. It was some of the happiest days of our life. We didn't have any money. But I never sent her to work. To me, my wife, actually, Prabhupada said the wife is Devi, she's goddess. To me, my wife is a goddess. I couldn't bear the thought of sending a goddess out to work in some mundane office with some karmi, lecherous, uh, meat eating, uh, cigarette smoking, who knows what they do. And I couldn't tolerate sending my, my goddess to such a place. So I never sent her to work. When I started the business, though, she was the best, she was, she was better than me in running the business. And she jumped right in and she was much better than me. She's a mercantile family, actually. <laughs> Her father was running like seven or eight businesses simultaneously. So, uh, I, I mean, immediately, when she was, I learned from her how to do the business. When, she, when I started the business, she was the real leader of the business. I was just trying to learn from her. She's so expert in the business. But it's not a hard and fast rule, and I know many, and I have many disciples who who's, uh, are working, and I don't tell them you have to stop working, I don't say that, but I just, I, but I preach the ideal principle is this, and if you can come to that ideal, that's good. It's very good if you can find a way to do it, because you can, that way you can raise your children to be more Krishna conscious, you have, you can preach to them, you can have nice programs, um, you can do homeschooling for the kids. Like uh, Arudha Madhaji in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S., she stayed at home. Her husband was an, um, a big employee with Hewlett Packard, the computer. Yeah, disciple in Australia. Huh? Well, disciple. I have a disciple in Australia. The wife stays at home and does homeschooling. Instead of sending the kids to public school, you can homeschool them. And they get a Krishna conscious education. This um, the boy uh, in, in the U.S. at the age 13, he was so qualified, he went to the university, by the age 13 he was attending the university, he got a PhD. Yeah, he, he, just, he, he was homeschooled all the way to the university. They're far ahead of the regular children. Much far ahead of the other kids. Can you imagine at the age 13, he went all through all the 12 grades at age 13, and he's going, he entered the university at age 13. And, then in and he excelled in the university, at age 13, he excelled in the university. And the Australian devotee, they like, First grade, but they're doing third grade. So I have a disciple in, uh, in Melbourne. Melbourne. The boy is, he's a first grade age, but he's doing third grade work now. And let's see where he is in a couple of years. It might be sixth grade, but in a couple more years. He's doing third grade work already. You see. So, this is ideal. We don't, it's not a rule in this kind. It's no policy from the GBC. Or, it's not a rule. The gurus don't require it either. Nobody's requiring it, but just saying, if you want to know what is Varnashram, this is Varnashram. The women don't go out and work in the material world. They stay at home, they make a wonderful Krishna conscious atmosphere. They do pujas. Uh, they, you know, have a wonderful atmosphere in the home. And that's that's the, the Varnashram system. We can gradually. We can't introduce it all at once. Uh, that's obviously. But gradually, over a period of time, understanding this is the ideal, we can gradually work in that direction. I just got an email from a lady. She's been working um, for 15 years, and she's virtually up. She's a, a big top-level executive in the company, but she's not really happy working, working out in the material world. She's a big, has a big position. She really doesn't want to do it. I told her actually, it's, I understand why you don't want to do it. It's not your dharma actually to be a, a, a business executive. 
uh, 15 years working in the, in the corporate world. It's not really her position. She's doing it. Now, I'm not telling her to stop, but I'm just saying, I understand why you don't want to do it. She says, I don't really feel like doing this. I'd rather not do this. I said, yes, this is a woman's nature, actually, not to do this kind of thing. It's your actual dharma. But I didn't tell her to stop. It's a matter of, we can't all of a sudden introduce Varnasham dharma. It's not practical. But by understanding what it is, we can gradually, over, you know, over a few generations it may take, we can gradually work in that direction. Varnasham dharma. Okay. And then, now I'm being criticized. This is not walking the talk, you are not this body. They're criticizing me for being a hypocrite. I don't know who had the audacity to write such offensive things. Really offensive. Tell me I'm a hypocrite by talking about Varnasham Dharma, different duties for men and women. This is, this is offensive. Whoever wrote this. I'm not walking my talk. How do you can face this offensive things? Completely against our philosophy. <clears throat> I agree with the fact that Bhagavad Gita preaches that we must surrender to Guru. But this guy has been producing many Gurus who have fallen down. Where can we find a fuller of a better foolproof institute. Is this the same person? Looks like the same handwriting. This is again offensive, very offensive. This kind's not very good, we need a better institution, that's what they're saying. Why don't you become proper, whoever's writing these things? Why don't you become proper in Krishna consciousness? You're trying to find fault with me, that I'm not preaching the philosophy correctly. You're trying to find fault with this kind. Why don't you get yourself straight? Whoever's writing these things, why don't you get yourself straight? You're off the track. You don't understand what it means to become Krishna conscious. You don't understand the practical application of this philosophy. You should get yourself and straightened out instead of finding fault with Prabhupada's disciples who are preaching, are spending their whole life to preach Krishna consciousness and save people from the cycle of birth and death. Then you criticize them for being hypocrites. What kind of nonsense, offensive mentality is this? You should be ashamed of yourself with writing this stuff. Okay, what are the transcendental senses? And transcendental senses are your, the spiritual body has transcendental senses. It's like you, the material body has eyes, ears, nose, etc. It's your transcendental body also. Can you describe the enjoyment sense through them? No, it's indescribable. You have to come to that level and you'll understand it. The devotee who cares for sick persons as an occupational duty, as a doctor or a nurse in particular, will it help him to advance in will it help her to advance in Krishna consciousness? I mean, will the patients, I mean, will, a, devotee, a devotee is taking care of sick persons, will it help her to advance in Krishna consciousness? Oh, will, will start taking care of people, sick people, help you to advance in Krishna consciousness? Not necessarily. Um, if you're just taking care of their bodies, but you're not actually giving them Krishna consciousness, Taking care of their bodies is not really going to help you to advance in Krishna consciousness. But if you utilize the income from that occupation in Krishna's service, then any occupation will help you to advance. But just taking care of people's bodies doesn't help you to advance in Krishna consciousness. No, it doesn't. The question I think is saying that will that help the patient to become Krishna? If the patient, if the doctor, if they prescribe prasadam or if they tell them to chant Hare Krishna, sure. They preach to them. What is the what is the main activities to to prefer to perform to becoming a powerful preacher? Be a very good listener. 
Prabhupada said, because I was a good hearer, now I'm a good speaker. You have to be able to listen very submissively and hear and learn. That is the qualification to become a powerful preacher. You have to be a powerful hearer. That's how you become a powerful speaker. You have to become a very, very powerful hearer. You can very deeply imbibe what, the, what you're being taught. That's the key. Did I want to add something? Mm -hmm. To advance in spiritual life, a devotee must chant 64 rounds of Japa daily. I don't know who's... Papa didn't say this. Well, where are you, where are you concocting these things? Papa said it's chant 16 rounds. Why are you concocting these new ideas? Why don't you read Papa's books? and preach from the books instead of telling you you have to chant 64 rounds of Japa daily. I don't know who's writing these crazy questions. One has to chant at least 16 rounds to advance nicely in Krishna consciousness. Right, haven't you heard, haven't you read Prabhupada's books? When does Prabhupada say we have to chant 64 rounds? No, where does he say we have to chant 64 rounds? Please give us the best way how to surrender to Lord Krishna. You have to take shelter of a modified spiritual master and be fully obedient to him. That's all. Can you read the books written by gurus who have fallen down? I mean, why would you want to do that? He fell down. How was he really a guru? That's my question. I, uh, I wouldn't be very interested in reading such books. But how... Somebody's asking these questions. That, they're like fault-finding type questions. I don't like these type of questions. They're like fault-finding questions. How, then how can we trust the writings of other gurus? Since the GBC doesn't give a, a guarantee of their status of being pure. I think somebody is asking these very fault-finding type questions. This is not Krishna conscious. It really isn't. They don't know. They're like, they come to ISKCON as like looking for faults. I can tell you, whoever's writing these sort of questions, you're not going to advance in Krishna consciousness. You're coming, you're trying to find fault with the Prabhupada movement. And, you know, it puts you in a very weak position. But I'll answer, I know. I'm just warning you, this sort of, these sort of questions are not good for your Krishna consciousness. Um, but I will answer the... Why only, why are you singling out the gurus? Anyone who's preaching, te preaching to you or guiding you, um, the, the potency or legitimacy of their example and their guidance, etc., is only valid up to the extent that they're actually fixed in Krishna consciousness. So, there are three different levels of devotees. There's Kanishta Adhikari, Majam Adhikari, and Uttam Adhikari. The Kanishta is not very qualified to guide you because his faith is weak. The Majama Adhikari, he actually sets a very good example because he has very strong faith. When it comes to philosophy, he may not always have the, the most powerful answers, <clears throat> um, but his faith is, he will not, the, the Majama Adhikari will never fall down properly. His faith is firm. The, the ideal devotee to be trained by is the Uttam Adhikari. His faith is unflinching, he'll never fall down. Plus, he is very, very expert in defeating all opposing philosophies. He has more ability than the Majam Adhikari in that department. He can completely, he can tear to shreds any counter philosophy, completely rip it to shreds and defeat it. Uh, he's a master at. Um, and the art of preaching, the art of logic, transcendental logic. So, as long as you're taking guidance and inspiration from the Majaman Adhikaris and the Uttamas, you're in good shape, you don't need to worry about anything. What you got to look out for is Kanishtas, those who are still materially inclined, who have taken the Krishna consciousness, who don't have firm faith, who still are weak in their, in their Krishna consciousness. Um, and those are not the people you want to take shelter of. So 
So if you find someone who actually has the qualities of a Madhyam Bhakta or an Uttama Bhakta, then you know you're in safe territory and you can read those person, read that, that person's books, you can follow his instructions, you can accept him as your spiritual master, you can give your whole life, your eternal existence to serve such a personality. Uh, but for Kanishta, it's not. These devotees who fell down, they were actually Kanishtas. But I don't care if they're a guru or a Sankirtan leader or whatever they may have been. It doesn't matter the position. There's so many positions in this kind. Guru is a position. Kajari, cook, you know, so many positions. Anyone who leaves, they never got beyond the Kanishta platform. This is according to Prabhupada's statement in his books that the Majam and the Uttama never fell down. So anyone who fell down, they were Kanishta. So you need to learn to distinguish. If you want to protect yourself from knowing who you should take guidance from, who you should get initiated by, etc., then you need to become expert to be able to distinguish between a Kanishta, a Majama, and an Uttama. That's what you have to do. There have we do have some we do have too many Kanishtas in this kind of thing. Not we won't try to brush out the carpet. But there are majamas and and um, there are uttamas here as well, so you have to open your eyes and learn how to find them and use your own intelligence and your own uh, dependence on Krishna and your own serenity Krishna to give you the, the realization and blessings to actually understand uh, those devotees who are on the Majam and Uttama platforms. Is there any collateral benefit when chanting in the Hare, when chanting the Hare Krishna mantra? There are so many benefits. Uh, yes, one of the collateral benefits is brain, or balance of brain. Here, here we have too much brain. If you, that's a, a fringe benefit, a collateral, the real benefit is develop love of God, but another benefit is you get the proper brain. Not too much, not too little. That's the benefit, the whole society will chant Hare Krishna, the brain will become balanced, that's a collateral benefit. We don't do it for that purpose, but that will be a collateral benefit. We chant Hare Krishna to awaken love of God. We have different degrees of surrender. Yes, there's 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, all the way up to 100. Different degrees. <coughs> Many people enjoy big game fishing in our ocean for sporting, and their photos are published in the newspapers. Do these people incur bad karma for killing fish? Will they be born as fish in their next birth? Yes. The people, they, they show the pictures of the fish, right? Well, guess who the fish was in his last life? He was one of the people who was, you know what I'm saying? If you, this, this lifetime he's standing, I caught this big fish, and the next, the next picture is a few years down the road, he'll be the fish. And somebody else will be holding him up. That's called karma. Okay. In spite of not ordering back to Prabhupada magazine, we got it by post. What should we do? Well, you can throw, you can tear it up and throw it away. That's the best thing to do. <laughs> or if you're uh, if you're a serious, <coughs> very serious preacher who wants to learn how to dismantle all opposing arguments, you can put it somewhere in a hidden place where you know not everybody can see it, but you can do research on their arguments, so you can learn how to dismantle every one of their arguments. If you're, if you're really, you know, if you're, um, if you have an aspirations of being a Digvijay Pandit, which Prabhupada told us we should all be, you can keep it in, as a, you can do, you can use it to find, to find ways to dismantle it. If you aspire to be a Digvijay Pandit. On the other hand, there is so much blasphemy. It's dangerous, it's dangerous, it's blasphemy. If you're weak, you better just throw it away. If you're if you're a powerful preacher who uh, really wants to be able to defeat all opposing arguments, then you can maybe read it, look over a few of the arguments before you trash it. I mean, I had a debate. But I must spend the other night. I had a debate with the editor of the Dr. Prophet. 
I, I, I had it, I went head on with him. And um, you know, he says that, you know, only in Prabhupada can be the guru. But I have a letter, Prabhupada personally encouraged me that I can be a spiritual mantra. So I said to him, in our debate, I said, well, Prabhupada, you say I cannot be a guru. Prabhupada encouraged me I can be. So, so I listened to you or to Prabhupada. And he couldn't say a word, you see. Well, that magazine is so much full of uh, blasphemy that another question will come where we will find a genuine guru. Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very poisonous magazine. I don't recommend it unless you're really, really, um, you know, if you're really, let's say if you're sannyas material, you know, or you're you know, Maha, uh, Divya Jai Pandit material, you really want to become a master uh, of defeating all the Pagan arguments, you might look it over to see how to dismantle the arguments. <laughs> it's better, to, if you want to do that, take, advantage, take help from somebody who's very senior and already knows how to, to dismantle all the arguments. So otherwise you might become bewildered. I mean, here's an example of what they did in one issue. They had a, they, I, I finally made it to Back to Prabhupada magazine. For a while they left me out there. Finally, I made it Back to Prabhupada magazine. I said, got it? He said, back to Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, um, Prabhupada, when he was in Melbourne, he, he um, the media, the devotees ran into Rolls Royce to pick him up. So the media got on this and said, how can you renunciate, how you can be riding in a Rolls Royce? They were criticizing Prabhupada. So Prabhupada said, when uh, he said, the, represent, the spiritual master is the representative of God, and when God travels, he travels in a golden chariot, so this Rolls Royce car is not sufficient. <laughs> so I told, I told this in one of my lectures, so... The Back, to the Back to Prabhupada magazine said that Sankarshan is very much in anxiety because his disciples don't pick him up in a Rolls Royce. <laughs> you know. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense things they do to try to defeat the gurus. They do it, Bhakti Chiru also is in their magazine. Your Bhakti Chiru is one of the Jai Pataka. Every guru in this kind. Uh, has has his day in back to Prabhupada. So Jai Pataka Swami, everyone. So isn't it offensive to read that magazine? Blasphemy It's dangerous. It, I can tell you it's very dangerous to hear blasphemy. But you know, I I do it. Some, actually, uh, I have a few of my saved, just, just so I can see what they're saying, so I can see how to dismantle it. But you know, you have to be pretty strong and to be able to, to even look at it. It's dangerous stuff. It's very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Because it's it's a simply blasphemy. Every every issue they'll take three or four gurus and have an article on each one to blaspheme him. That's it. This this month we're blaspheming this guru, this guru, this guru. The next month that I guru that I, every month they pick a few gurus and blaspheme them. That's the whole that's the magazine, you can imagine. And um, people there are people who love the magazine, think it's a great magazine. Because they get, yeah, those are scum gurus, they're no good, a bunch of rascals, a bunch of demons, a bunch of rakshas, yeah, those this kind of demon gurus are no good. And they think, yeah, it's the greatest magazine in the whole world, and there's people who like it. This proves that we're a very powerful movement, because every, in history, every powerful movement has splinter groups. The Rhythmic movement proves that ISKCON is a juggernaut. You understand? You know what a juggernaut is? You know what a juggernaut is? Who knows what a juggernaut is? It's an, the Britishers, during British rule, they would come, they would see the Jagannath Rathayatra in Puri, and they'd see this huge chariot, this powerful chariot coming down the road. So, the Jagannath means an irresistible force. A powerful, irresistible force is an English word that it was coined from, it was taken from Jagannath. Juggernaut. So Iskan is actually a juggernaut. It's a powerful, irresistible force. And envious people who aren't a part of it, they want to find fault with it. So they start these kind of groups. That's all. It's, this, this, this rhythmic people simply prove that Iskan is a powerful, irresistible force which is going to take over the whole world eventually. They're envious, that's all. They're simply envious snakes. I even saw a video, they, they, uh, they came to the Ratha Yatra. A video of my Guru Gadras were standing there, they came and started just yelling at the Vinasarupa. 
and started like a barking dog, just yelling in the middle of the Ratha Yatra festival in the street, started yelling and screaming at him, if you can imagine. How fat, how blasphemous they are. I saw the video of these people. So, yeah, you're lucky if you don't have them in here doing much in, in Mauritius. They go to places where there's big festivals like New York or Los Angeles and they pass out their literature and they, you know, it's very, they're very envious people. Okay. Because of the magazine, many give up their gurus. Yeah, some people may give up their gurus. I, I you know, I know people who, who were disciples of ISKCON gurus and they uh, gave up, influenced by Vintage philosophy, they gave up ISKCON, they gave up their guru. A, these people are getting a huge karmic reaction. As I explained last night, the, the head uh, pundit of the Vedic movement, he, he was a youth growing up as a member of the Bhaktivedanta Youth Forum in the Bhaktivedanta Manor. He was, and uh, he never called his parents mother and father. He always call, insisted on calling them by their first names. Because he never wanted to respect anybody as an authority. Now how many of you kids growing up or you adults in any if any, even in America, I called my parents mother and father. Even in America. Well, to speak of uh, Gujarati culture or Indian culture, you know. He was a Gujarati boy. He insisted on calling his parents by their first names. So when he came to ISKCON, he didn't want to accept any authority either. He wouldn't accept his parents as an authority. He doesn't want to accept in ISKCON any authority either. That's where he started this mythic philosophy. He took advantage of some mythic philosophy that had been... The original Vitvic philosophy was started by, uh, under the direction of one of my uh, blue god brothers named Nityananda Das. He wanted to find, he was very envious, he wanted to, he was, uh, he had a business with selling drug paraphernalia through the uh, mail order. That was how he earned his living as a, uh, as a house owner. He sold drug paraphernalia through the uh, mail order business. He sold drug paraphernalia and he had a good money making business and selling drug paraphernalia. You know, illicit drugs like marijuana. And, you know. That was his business, selling drug paraphernalia. And he was very envious of the leadership of this kind. He wanted to find a way to defeat the gurus, so he hired two uh, Brahmins. He paid them. He said, I'm putting you on, my, on a salary. You come up with a philosophy to defeat the gurus, or I'm going to cut off your paycheck. He, they were paid, they were paid, they were maintained by him. Their family, you know, they were given a salary and they, they were maintained by him and, and they had to, he paid them to come up some way to find a way to keep the guru. So they came up with this rhythmic idea and then it was, and then now the, the original, this is Rupa Velasquez, he was paid to do this. Now he's renounced the philosophy. He doesn't accept it. And, uh, but then this Krishna Sai picked it up and made a book called um, The Final Order. Um, this book, The Final Order, they take an instruction that Prabhupada gave in uh, July of 1977, in which he named 11 devotees to act as vitviks, or to initiate people on behalf of Prabhupada. And he says, this is the final order regarding initiation, but that's not true. You see, here's, I'll give you the details so you understand correctly. In May of 1977, there was a meeting with Prabhupada and the GBC. He said that after his disappearance, the devotees would become uh, disciples of Prabhupada's disciples. And Prabhupada said, after my disappearance, they will become my grand disciples. Uh, my disciples will initiate. These new devotees will be as, they will be regular gurus, and these new, these new devotees will become the disciples of my disciples. He said in May of 1977, he said that would be the system. So then in July, um, it's, up to that point, Prabhupada had been very actively engaged in the initiation process. He would, you know, chant on the beads, he would pick the names, he used to do the yagyas personally also. But now he's on his sick bed. So he doesn't have the energy to be involved in that. So he had these 11 devotees do all the part, all the functions. They would decide who would be ready, they would pick the name, they would chant on the beads. That during the, between July and October of 1977, that was the system. They were, these 11 did all the functions. Prabhupada was just laying in his sick bed. They would pick the name, they would chant on the beads, and they would do the yoga and, uh, and initiate them as Prabhupada's disciples. 
and then in October, on October 18th of 1977, Prabhupada said, now he's getting really sick, it was, he, it was obvious he was leaving the world very soon, he said, now I will no longer initiate. And he, he, not, and he started the system, but now his disciples initiate the system in October. That's the, the final order regarding initiation was given on October 18th, when Prabhupada said, now I will no longer initiate, and he started the system as in the disciples initiate their own disciples. He started on October 18th. So that's the actual final order regarding initiation. It was given not in the July letter, it was, which is only a temporary policy um, while Prabhupada was sick but still here. And then um, very sick but still on the planet. That was the Vithic system between July and October. But then in October, he ate the he passed it on, the torch on to the next generation, his disciples will now start initiating. That was, that was the final order regarding initiation, not the temporary order given in July while he was sick but still in this world. So that says it, says it pretty clearly. Any more questions down there? That's it. Here's one last question. What is surrender? What? Or what is Sanatan? Uh, what is an oh what is an avatar? Okay, it was all merged together. An avatar means one who descends. Um, this, Krishna descends from the, the spiritual sky, he's called an avatar. So there's many different incarnations of God they're called avatars because they descend from the spiritual world. Avatar can also apply to someone who is endowed with the potency of the Lord. A Shakta Besh avatar means the one who has the, who possesses Krishna Shakti. Krishna Shakti Vina Nari Tara Ravartanam. Unless one has Krishna Shakti, he cannot spread the Krishna Karnas movement all over the world. So a powerful Acharya who has the potency, the power, and the purity to, to make the whole world Krishna conscious, as we see in Prabhupada, for example. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Dakur. Such powerful acharyas, even though they're not Krishna himself, they're also called avatars, Shaktivesha avatars. Prabhupada said, the Lord Jesus also is Shaktivesha avatar. So, that's, that's the meaning of avatar. So that's our questions have run out now, so if there's nothing else, we can wrap it up. And we thank you all very much for your participation in this Krishna Congress movement. Kindly make this your life and soul to be fully dedicated to the order of Krishna and Guru. Um, give your life completely to make this ISKCON mission a success. I see our temple president, Ajay Krishna, Ajay Chaitanya Prabhu is here. Please kindly work uh, under his, he is the appointed authority here. Please kindly work uh, cooperatively under his direction and the direction of your GBCs uh, to make this, this center here a grand success. This is what Prabhupada wants. We should all work together in harmony as one spiritual family to make a spiritual revolution, to create an, a, an atmosphere, a situation in which the whole world can come and be a part of this movement and there can be true world peace and prosperity for everyone throughout every country and eventually the entire universe, actually. So we thank you very much. Shira Prabhupada Ki Jai. Bhagavad Gita Ki So, so this yours is your home? Are we in your home? No. Whose home is this? This is her mother's home. Oh, the mother's home. Okay, where's the mother? I can give this garland. Where is the mother? Is she here? She attended the program. <laughs> 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 <laughs>